The HR Stories podcast is brought to you by the team at HR Stories. The team at HR Stories helps anyone with HR responsibility be better at managing the employee experience. To engage with us, go to thehrstoriesteam.com and learn more about how we can support your business or nonprofit. Have you ever wondered why a company would do something so stupid that would cost them their brand reputation, hundreds of thousands of dollars, and some of their best employees? Each week, management and HR consultants John Tolheimer and Chuck Samikian dive into the stories that matter and discuss the lessons and what we should do to protect our organizations. Welcome to the HR Stories Podcast, where there is a lesson in every story. On this week's episode, John and Chuck talk about wage and hour violations and what are the five audits you need to do with your payroll team to make sure that you are compliant. But first, here's what's happening in the human resources news. We're live on the HR Stories podcast, where there's a lesson in every story. <laughs> How are you this morning, Chuck? I'm fine. How's my deep voice sounding this morning, John? <clears throat> it's good. You sounded very good this morning. Uh, I'm I'm in Pennsylvania. I didn't know if you knew that this week. I'm in up in Pennsylvania visiting uh, family. Working remotely, I see. Well, you know, I'm dropping into the podcast. I can't, you know, I can't miss a podcast episode. So I wanted to be here for you. Uh, so we do apologize, ladies and gentlemen, if there are sound and technical difficulties. It's because I am on a small laptop and uh, maybe things are not as good as when I'm in the home studio. So just to let you know that. So, Chuck, what's happening in the news in your area? There is a lot of stuff going in the news, not so much in, in my area, although Florida, as I live in Florida, Florida is full of uh, HR-related uh, news coming out of our uh, capital in Tallahassee. But we're not going to go political today. Uh, however, I will share with you some really interesting things that I came across uh, this last couple of days. And the first one I just want to share with you is this is really interesting, John. And the headline is, are you ready? Ex HR director uh -oh. sues. Yeah, he sues his company, Honeywell, for sabotaging his job and firing him because of age. So uh -huh. this this yeah, this person, this this guy joins Honeywell. He's 55 years old, and he says he was treated differently than the younger employees. He joined in July 2020. He, he he received positive feedback and recognition for his job performance from coworkers and associates and management. And then in December 2020, a couple months later, changed supervisors reporting to a VP of HR. And he says the the, the new uh, supervisor canceled a series of one-on-one -on -one meetings and then started perform uh, telling him, guess what? By the way, your performance is substandard. And this guy's like, what are you talking about? I've been here six months. I've gotten all this great feedback. And so he says, look to his new boss, can you have a, can I have a performance improvement plan? You know, I, just tell me what I'm doing wrong. What can I work on? And the supervisor, VP of HR, refuses to to do this and says, can you just train a, 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 another person who ended up being his replacement? And oh. so, yeah. And so it's the interesting thing is aside from the cancellation of meetings, uh, this, this HR director was the oldest employee on the Honeywell HR team. He says he was treated differently than the younger people and, uh, his, his supervisor would meet with all, and this is the stuff with harassment, right? Exclusion, right? So right. exclusion yeah. can be a form of harassment. So what ends up happening is this VP would meet with everyone else on the team rather than this one director. So it's interesting when it comes to harassment and, and this type of thing is, was harassment going on? I don't know. Is it, could it be legally proven? I don't know. Maybe there's other things going on. But as we know, with the EEOC, they use that um, uh, prima facie, right, on face value. If there's smoke, there may be fire. And in this case, it looks like some things are adding up, including, including exclusion right, from yeah. – 
meetings and performance plans. So this this guy may have a case. And it's interesting when you when the HR director files a lawsuit, huh? Yeah, <laughs> yeah you know, it's, you know, it's bad that when that's happening. And um, and so was I don't know if you mentioned this, was there his boss, the VP of human resources? Yeah, so he was a director of HR at Honeywell, and then okay. somehow they must have had a re an alignment uh, after in dis about six months after he started. So he started reporting to a new VP of HR. Got it. Okay. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Oh, that's that's gonna. It'll be interesting to see where it ends. Do they settle? Um, my guess is they're gonna probably settle that. Uh, I could be wrong, but they could probably settle that um, just because it's just not worth the effort for Honeywell to fight it. Yeah, yeah. Well, the guy, uh, the the, and it's a, it's a gentleman, a man, says that uh, he was terminated. Okay, but because of his the low rating they gave him, he lost twenty six thousand dollar performance bonus. So I think uh, they'll probably figure out a way to make him whole and just make right. this all go away. Right. Yeah. And again, I mean, that's. I mean, those are. The, I think you know, listeners. I think that's the thing that sometimes happens is your company just makes the best decision. Um, that it's just easier to pay the person off and let them go and not get into involved in that kind of stuff. And uh, sometimes we get into, not in the sexual harassment way, but we get into arbitration and we're dealing with that, some of that as well. So um, just something to be paying attention. It's always an option for your, um, for your company, right? To kind yeah, of what do you got? that kind of stuff. John. Well, it's interesting. I don't know if you've been paying attention, but uh, so Tuesday, um, the Supreme Court um, just had a conversation about religious accommodations uh, in yes. the workplace. And so there's a big court case uh, years ago called Hardison, where the Supreme Court determined that an employer, the, the employer in the case would not would not need to bear more than de minimis cost in order to accommodate an employee's request for Saturdays off. So this had a religious person needed a Saturday off as this poses an undue hardship. Right. And so now there's a case going through this up It's in the Supreme Court it was heard on Tuesday where uh, Groff, a post person, uh, delivery person, was asked to work on Sundays. Well, he had a religious belief that that was the Lord's Day and he was going to take the Lord's Day off. So at first, um, I mean, it's really more complicated than this, but I'm going to kind of uh, simplify it. So at first they um, said, all right, well. Um, obviously, you're not making that requirement. You're not coming in on Sunday. The, the employer said you're not coming in on Sunday. So we're going to move you to another post office, which doesn't have Sunday hours. And that was fine. That was going on. That was fine. And then because they signed a contract with Amazon or one of the delivery companies um, for Sunday deliveries, Mm -hmm. This this individual was then asked to work Sundays again and said, no, I have this. And so um, the company, the United States Postal Service is saying, look, this is more than de minimis, right? We can't do our job. We can't support our customers. Uh, we need people to work on Sundays. Um, and so that's where it's at. And so this could change a lot of things in terms of how we do religious accommodations. We know this particular Supreme Court um, – really believes in the freedom of religion, that the freedom to exercise religion. And so it'll be interesting to see how this plays out and what the limits they put in place on that. Do they raise it above de minimis or is it even higher? Like you have to show that it's a complete undue burden to your company. So it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Yeah, it will have a wide ranging impact on the companies, and I'm going to say hospitality, uh, restaurants, hotels, theme retail. parks, retail, anyone that's open Sunday. You know, when I was a kid, John, they had something called Blue Laws, where yeah. you couldn't have, you. everyone was closed on Sunday. Like, yeah. everyone was closed. And I'll never forget when the mall near me, it was a place called South Hills Village, when the mall opened up on a Sunday and it was like limited, like from 12 to five or 11 to five or something like that. And I was like, wow, this is really weird. You can go grocery shopping and do things on a Sunday. And so it was crazy things like that. But 
I will tell you, working in the themed hospitality hotel industry, working Sundays is a huge day because we are very, 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 very busy. A lot of employees don't like working on Sundays, but we would need them, especially the newer employees. And a lot of times it was a length of service seniority thing. So it'll be interesting to see what happens and how many people find religion uh, all of a sudden, maybe, and maybe that's a little callous to say, but I, I, yeah. I could see that <laughs> happening, you know, yeah, to I mean, get out of working on Sundays. I, well, it'll be interesting to see how they define it, right? Because think of all the businesses that are open on Sunday. I mean, like you listed all of those, but I mean, we could go entertaining. Um, I'm thinking of NASA. I'm thinking of, you know, big tech companies, all of them that need to have people working on Sunday. And so, or, you know, so how are they going to do that? Um, especially if there's a good portion of the United States that's saying, look, Sunday is the Lord's day. I need the day off or Saturday is the Lord's day. I need, you know, I need that Saturday off. Um, So it's going to be interesting how it plays out. I don't really, I don't know how they're going to, I don't, I don't know how they're going to judge. Right. And so again, we haven't listened to the, I didn't get a chance to listen to the arguments yet, Um, but I think that will give us an idea, but it'll be interesting to see how they kind of play this out. Sure, sure. And and I will tell you, there were times people would come and say, I can't, well, let's, let's talk about this. We, could you have, you have to go to church? Well, let's, let's maybe, can you work an afternoon shift? You know, I worked at years ago, Kmart, right? I'll still never forget. T-Y-S-F-O-K. T-Y-S-F-O-K, John. T- Thank you for shopping our Kmart. That was uh, the tagline. Every day. And I was a cashier for, for two summers at Kmart and, and they paid if you worked on Sundays, you got time and a half. Didn't matter whether or not you were uh, un- part time, full time. You had that was your only day of the week that you worked. You got time and a half, and that's got people to work, right? Because when when you're at Kmart making four twenty five an hour, <laughs> you're, you're showing your time age. and a half is big time, big time money. Right. So wow. Uh, All right. Well, speaking of places that work on on Sundays, let's talk Hooters. Okay. All right. Wow. Uh, okay. Who does? That's right. Well, <laughs> here's the deal. Uh, it's not so much a Hooters problem, but it is a <laughs> okay. problem with the Department of Justice, uh, and they manage and oversee I nines. And when when you a lot of companies don't realize this is in the news. This came out just uh, yesterday. So Hooters has a problem. Had to settle with Department of Justice because they were request they refused to take a worker's I nine documents. So this this Hooters franchisee has this employee that that shows up, and apparently she is not an American citizen. But okay. for some reason, the person at meets the manager or whatever says, "Well, uh, we don't, hi- you know, we can't hire you. You need to give me more documentation." So she provides all the documentation that's necessary. She's a non-citizen, and they still refuse to accept. And it was valid documentation. It showed her permission to work in the country, and they kept requesting additional documentation that can come across as um, uh, and and basically immigration naturalization act prohibits employers from asking for specific documents as we know and a lot of times right. employees will say what should i bring and employees oh driver's license social security card driver's license and you you can't say that and so they we're in big time trouble. And it's interesting, John, remember we talk about a lot of times it's more than just the money. So it ends up, they have to provide training to their managers. They have to have a consultant come in and monitor all of their, their, their hiring processes. And because it came across as retaliation, intimidation, and they're not the only ones that have done that. But have you ever seen that before? Have you ever run into that? Well, I, I mean, I've heard of stories. I it's never happened in any place that I have ever worked, um, but I've heard many stories where 
there are that I think what your example was the driver's license and the social security number, right? Because a lot of times we need the employee's driver's license. We need the employee's social security number for something else. And so we're like, well, just give us that. We can use it for the I-9. Um, but I always coach people to like send them that document. Here's the documents. Pick whatever you want to choose from that. Oh, and by the way, I'm going to need your driver's license and social security for something else. Um, and so just making sure that you're giving them that opportunity to do that, um, I think is important. And it's so easy. So my question about this case, and you may not know, so was this just a franchisee or was this, did that bubble up to all the, to all the Hooters? No, no, it was a, fra- it was a franchisee. It was so, okay. so for these folks, it was a franchisee, but I don't know. Sometimes franchisees will ask the corporate office for yeah, yeah, yeah. direction. Well, and I think one of the things we see a lot of um, is where franchisees, uh, who are representing a brand, do something illegal, do something stupid, and that hurts the brand reputation, which is in their franchisee agreement, and then they lose their franchise license. Um, and so, again, I think if you work, if, I don't know if we have listeners out there that work in franchise, uh, make sure that you are following the laws. And if there's any question, always reach out to corporate and go, hey, this is what we're doing. Is that Okay. But make sure that you tell them what state you're in because the state laws yeah. are going to be a little bit different. So kind of paying attention By the way, to that. Becomes more. Yeah, and that's that's true. State laws, especially now Florida requires a couple of things. But interesting enough, this was in Florida. This was up in a place called Destin, which is in the, oh, yeah. the panhandle. Oh, yeah. In the oh, panhandle. yeah, I've been to Destin. But- Destin is a great, 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 great city. You know, and 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 just and just real quickly, uh, just another example of this. There's a group called Lady M Confections. They're up in New York, and they had the same problem. They they kept asking for additional and unnecessary documentation for this person to verify his eligibility to work in the United States. And once again, the Tar- Department of Justice says that an employee. A uh, potential employee applicant can provide whatever documentation they choose as long as it shows that they uh, – they're valid documents and it shows they're eligible to work in the United States. So, folks, I have to tell you, and I'll, I'll end with this, John, because I know you want uh, – you may have something else or may want to go on a break. But when I audit I-9s, and you and I do a lot of HR audits, and folks, by the way, if you need someone to come in before the Justice Department of Justice comes in <laughs> – you know, you, you you hear better call Saul. I don't know. It's a, a, a TV show. Better call Chuck and John. OK, better call the team at HR Stories because we can help you audit not only your HR processes, but we can do a deep dive into your I-9s. And every time I go into I-9s, I, I see things where – like column A, B, and C are all filled out. Like sometimes companies feel like they oh. have to get everything because that will show that, boy, they really, really tried to to get their passport and their license and their certificate and their birth certificate. Look, we 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 really covered ourselves. And I'll be like, no, you you <sighs> don't need to do that. That's going to get you in more trouble. So, <laughs> yeah, I oh. I will tell you, John, one of the things I've noticed when I go in to audit do HR yep. audits and assessments as you and I have talked before. First thing I look at is the I-9s. The first thing I look at is a company's I-9s during an HR audit and assessment. Because if the I-9s are in great shape, I have a pretty good inkling the rest of the HR processes are going to be in good shape. But if the I-9s are a mess, or depending yeah, you know on, on the level of, of messness, nah. I know that the <laughs> HR audit is going to be uh, a little more involved and a little more challenging, and we're going to have to fix a lot of things. So that's yeah. it for so, my. Yeah, I just want to add to that. I just so some advice for you listeners out there. Um, you can do your own self audit for I nines. You can definitely do that. One of the documents I would get from the United States Customs and Immigration Services is the M two seven four, and that is for the employer, and it's a guideline on how to properly fill out the I-9. So there's a lot of great information on that. And so just download it, go to their website. I think if you go to Google and put an M274 I-9 or something like that, it will probably be one of the first top documents. Um, And then just kind of download it, read it. You can go through it. Now, look, 
don't have time, you're a little concerned, you have questions, reach out to Chuck and I. But good self-audit. I think you could at least start there to do that as well. So, Or get the ultimate book of HR checklist, which is a book that we <laughs> wrote as the team at HR Stories. And we have a we have a whole section on I-9s, I-9 audits, what to do, and and how to stay compliant. Uh, yeah, that's so. great. So, Chuck, let's do this. Let's take a break. We're about 20 minutes into the show today. Uh, let's take a break. We got a great couple of great stories I saw. So this is going to be good. I'm interested in learning a little bit more about this. All right. See you on the other side. Hello, listeners. I have some questions for you. Do you find yourself struggling with HR and employment issues? Are you afraid you could make the wrong employment decision that will cost your company thousands or even millions of dollars? Maybe you're new to the world of HR or you've been in HR for a while and you just wish you had one resource, a guide to help you get HR right. Well, I've got good news for you. The team at HR Stories is excited to announce a new comprehensive resource the Ultimate Book of HR Checklist. We created the Ultimate Book of HR Checklist as a simple step-by-step -step resource guide packed with 70 downloadable checklists and other resources that help small businesses and organizations get human resources right. Even with very little HR or management experience, you can get instant results with concise, practical steps for addressing many of your tough employment issues. Do not miss out. Go to hrchecklist.com to learn more. That's hrchecklists with an S, dot com to learn more. And as always, thanks for listening to the HR Stories podcast, where the lesson is always in the story. Welcome back to the HR Stories podcast, where there is a lesson in every story. <clears throat> Today, John and Chuck are talking about the five payroll audits that you need to do. All right, Chuck, we've been waiting. What are these audits? Tell me, tell me, what, why do I need to do an audit? That's too much work. I don't want to do them. Why are they important? Yeah, I know. Stick. Here's the deal. Ignore it, and it'll go away, and it'll be great. <laughs> John, <laughs> yeah. Now, there are so many stories in relation to this subject. I, I couldn't figure – it was just tough to choose some things. But So I've got a multiple uh, list of different short stories and examples to kind of emphasize our point today. And our point today, we're going to be discussing conducting a payroll audit. You know, as an HR professional or as a, as a business owner, it's important – to ensure that your company's payroll process processes are three things. Okay. Okay. You need to make sure that your company's payroll processes are accurate, that they are compliant, and that they are efficient. Now, right. these three things, yeah, these three things are crucial for maintaining a healthy and successful business. Um. Let's and I want to break it down. Like accuracy is essential, and it's, it goes without saying, right? Oh, it's, of course, payroll needs to be accurate. And I tell folks, <laughs> don't mess with someone's paycheck. And oh, if yeah. you, if you make a mistake, you need to fix it right away. Not only from a legal perspective, but from a and an ethical, but from a and a morale and an engagement perspective. Because uh, if you can't get paychecks right. Uh, it doesn't matter how many company parties and, hey, we're having free cake today for someone's birthday. If you can't get paychecks right, <laughs> stop all that other stuff and, yeah. and get the paychecks right first. Yeah, and I always tell uh -huh. super, new supervisors, like, your first course of business is to make sure your employees are getting paid properly uh, because for what you said, Chuck, nothing else matters if that's not happening, right? And so making sure that happens is first. So, yeah, accuracy is important. I got it. Yeah. It leads to underpayment, overpayment. Overpayment's a big one. I've seen that before. Disputes with employees, inaccuracies can lead to penalties uh, from the government agencies for not complying with tax laws and regulations. So accuracy is huge. Compliance is important, number two, because it ensures, well, the Fair Labor Standards Act, we're following all relevant laws, and 
state payroll laws. And as you and I say often enough, know what your state laws are because, well, they change. They change. <laughs> and, yeah. and, well, and, and I think and a lot of times, I, I think a lot of times, Chuck, is when that small business owner, or the, HR, the HR department of one, we get a system in place and we're thinking, all right, we got this. We're doing good. And they're not paying attention to, hey, the Fair Labor Standard Act wants you to do that this way now, or the state says, all right, you need to do this, or you have an employee that's going to be working in another state, and you're like, you know what, what's good enough for my state is going to be good enough for that state, and that may not be the case. Um, and so just always going back, and I mean, that's the purpose of the audit, right? You want to self-check, are we doing everything that we need to be doing to be compliant with the law, I think is really important. Yeah. And then the third thing is efficiency. And you're like, efficiency? And yeah, you know, efficiency is important, is essential because it can help save time, money, streamlining payroll processes, reducing potential errors. Efficient payroll process can also help improve employee satisfaction by ensuring that employees are paid accurately and on time. And yes, efficiency, John, can cost money because you do want to have some sort of payroll uh, processing system in place. It, it could be some people use something as simple as QuickBooks payroll or ADP or paychecks, paylocity, all these. But bamboo. Yeah, but it's kind of like people that say, well, we don't want to use it too expensive. Well, you know what? It's kind of like a pay me now or pay me later. Take a chance, do it all manually or pay for a service to help and partner with to to do your payroll. Yeah, and if you're you're the HR person responsible for HR, there's going to be a time as your company grows that you have to go back and look at your systems to go, is this the right system? Is this where we want to put our energy in? Because if you're spending a lot of time getting your payroll accurate, right? You're doing it yourself, you're making sure the payroll is accurate. What else aren't you getting done in compliance, right? And so, again, sometimes you have to make that decision, all right, let's go to hire a third party or hire an additional person to get your payroll right. So then we as the department of two now, the HR department can now focus on bigger and other important things as well. So just kind of yeah. always have to focus on that. I think it's at the time management part that we always talk about. Exactly. And based on these cru three, three cu crucial elements, we're going to be discussing five key areas to focus on when conducting a payroll audit, as well as some common mistakes to, to look for. But before we do that, I just want to talk about, for some of our newer listeners and those that are new in HR, the government agency that oversees these areas. Pretty much, folks, it's the Department of Labor. There's a couple government agencies out there, Department of Justice, the IRS, the EEOC, and, and IRS is concerned too, right? They're, they're concerned. Yeah, they got some skin in the game there. <laughs> they got some skin in the game. But overall, the Department of Labor uh, over has, has two main agencies on OSHA. We all know OSHA, but it's another area is called the wage and hour department and wage and hour are the enforcers. They're the shock troops. They're the ones that show up and say, we want to see your payroll records. We want to see your, your, uh, well, your payroll records. And we may want to talk to some of your employees and we want to see your files and run us a roster. And sometimes they'll send a letter and they'll say, send us these things, but more than frequently enough, they may show up. They're like the men in black. They show up in their suits and their shirts <laughs> and their ties. And I'm, I, of course, there's w women too, right? So, but I'm just saying, they're like the men in black. They show up with their, and they are ready to go. And you might say, well, I, I've got a, uh, an event tomorrow. I don't have time to do this. No, it doesn't matter. They want to see your stuff now and they're flashing badges. It's really unnerving, uh, but it, it can happen. So if it does happen, and as our friend uh, Lisa Smith, who runs the HR help desk says, a lot of times you cannot be audit proof, right, John? You can't just be, oh, we're audit proof, but you can close that gap and you can be what Lisa calls as audit secure. So if you don't do these things, folks, this is you. And yeah. you know what that is? 
Uh, Chuck, Chuck, that demonstration's not working very well on the video on the oh. on, on the uh, podcast. <laughs> so Chuck is there. His arms are. I'll, I'll do the. I'll do the play by play. Chuck's mm-hmm. arms are wide, wide, wide out. Yes, and that is yes. what Chuck. Full exposure. Are, I am. Oh, fully full exposed. Exposure. Yeah. All right. <laughs> I am fully exposed. And what you want to do? And now Chuck is what? Bringing his hands together. Hands. Chuck's hands are a... now becoming closer and closer together. Yeah. This is this is this is great podcasting, Chuck. Remember the visual. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah. Play. But this play. is a good, this is a good kind of comment that I know we've been kind of teasing here, but we do do a YouTube channel. Um, so if you do want to check us out on the YouTube channel, uh, we'll put that link in the uh, notes so you can see the visuals of Chuck and I as we present. Um, always good to do. All right. So let's get into this, Chuck. I want to know what is the first area of focus. Sure. And by the way, that was a thunderclap. My, I'm going from arms wide all the way back, closing my hands together, saying you're just closing that gap. All right. The first area to focus on is employee classifications. John, we've done a numerous amount of stories and podcasts on classifications, and it's important to verify that all employees are classified correctly uh, as either exempt or Our non-exempt common mistakes include misclassifying employees, failing to track that overtime correctly. The IRS really cares about this because if you, uh, if you classify people as, as contractors and they should be employees, that's a big problem because they're not collecting taxes. Uh, And, and if you're classifying people as exempt, to save on overtime, then you're not paying them for all hours worked. And I'll tell you a quick story, 2018. And there's so many stories, folks. You, you could go back and, and hear a number of our podcasts about this. But for example, 2018, a California based company was ordered to pay $4.5 million in back wages and damages for misclassifying employees as independent contractors. The employees should have been classified as employees and were therefore entitled to overtime pay and benefits. Company failed to conduct a proper audit of its employee classifications leading to these legal consequences. Yeah. And I, and I think one of the things, I mean, I, I, so there's two types of misclassification just to clarify for everyone. There is the, um, the Fair Labor Standard Act classification between exempt and non-exempt, right? And so making sure that you're treating people, if they're supposed to be non-exempt, you're treating them like non-exempt. Um, if they're, um, so that's the one, right? Non-exempt and exempt. Um, non-exempt, typically folks get overtime or do get overtime. I guess I shouldn't say typically get overtime. And then there's the difference when we're misclassifying workers as independent contractors versus employees. And that is the one that we see a lot in construction industries. We see it a lot where somebody's like, oh, I'm just going to bring this person in for six months. Um, and so they're going to be a temporary independent contractor. We're just going to have them do this. And they're doing the exact same thing as somebody else in the business. And they should be being treated as an employee. Um, and so Companies do it a lot of the times because, oh, it's cheaper, it's easier, that's kind of stuff. I will tell you, I've run into situations, Chuck, where managers find it much easier to hire an independent contractor than to go through the whole HR process of hiring an employee. Um, And so sometimes managers are like, I just got to do this. I need somebody tomorrow where you're like, wait, you can't do that. You can't bring somebody in. We need to do the process. And so sometimes that's where that tension lies between HR and managers on there. So, yeah, exactly. And so just a couple of tips, just uh, verify all your employees are classified correctly as either exempt or non-exempt, as you said, verify whether they should be employees or independent contractors and uh, verify that they're being paid at the correct correct rate based on the classification. Review your payroll records to ensure all overtime is being paid correctly and verify that all deductions are being taken out. And if you have questions about that, once again, the ultimate book of HR checklist, we've got a whole section devoted to uh, this on this topic of employee classifications, as well as numerous previous podcasts. So the second one is uh, to focus on in your payroll audit is look at time and attendance. And when you hear that, what does that mean? That means 
time cards, right? Swiping in. How are people, uh, you know, swiping in? How are you recording their hours worked? How are you doing it correctly? Common mistakes include employees clocking in and out for each other, <laughs> uh, employees working off the clock, either uh, with your knowledge or without your knowledge. And the work from home situation has uh in in since covid has bubbled that up a lot because hourly employees are at home they walk by their computer they may check their emails real quickly and after hours and so that is something to watch out for and then finally failing to accurately track breaks and meal periods john there are so many stories so many stories with this but i've got a few examples yeah, before you jump into those examples, the other place people get in trouble is managers changing the time records. Um, yes. Either with the employee's knowledge or without the employee's knowledge. Um, so if you're going to, for some reason, if there has to be a time clock change, you better make sure that you have the employee initialing it and signing it and dating it uh, and making sure that there's a clear reason that, that there was a mistake on that time clock. Um, so yeah. it's got time punch and that kind of time punch. Yeah. Sorry. You know, it's funny you mentioned that. That was one of my stories because just recently, just yesterday, oh. uh, we're in April 2023. Just this week, the U.S. Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division, the investigators announced that they had recovered $22,744, representing, by the way, $11,372 in back wages. Well, where's the other money come from? Guess what? What they do is they double that amount that they recover as a penalty. You know, we tell people this when we teach payroll law classes, we tell people this, but I don't think they believe us. Well, there's a great example right here. So equal amount in liquidated damages for 12 workers at this Taco Bell in Spencer, Iowa. And the investigators determined that the restaurant violated the Fair Labor Standards Act minimum wage provisions when the general manager of the store started deducting time from employees' time cards before submitting the hours uh. To the corporate office. Now, uh, I wasn't able to, because of the short turnaround, I saw this, I, I wasn't able to dig into it. But typically, things like this happen. Who knows why? Maybe the general manager wanted to deduct hours as a penalty, saying, well, you, you know, you right. were going to, you know, you were late or you were this or you didn't do a good job or or maybe they were deducting hours because they didn't want to share overtime. So they were maybe shuffling hours from one week to another week. It doesn't matter the reason, but the deal is without, as your point is, without the employee's knowledge, this GM was doing that and it cost yeah. them uh, some change. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. Right. And so again, um, and sometimes the general manager doesn't want to get in trouble with corporate for having too many over hours of overtime. And so they cut the overtime down or change something on there. Do not, as Chuck said in the beginning of this episode, do not mess with the um, employee's pay. Do yeah. not mess. And sometimes people think, oh, well, well they'll never notice. They're going to notice, folks. They're oh, my gosh. Notice. I, why yeah. would you ever think that? That's crazy. Oh, my goodness. Yeah. yeah. And they may think they're taking advantage of kids or whatever, but the kids have their parents and the parents always know someone that knows someone. But hey, in right. 2019, a Texas-based company was fined even more, $1.6 million <laughs> for violating overtime laws. The company failed, get this, to accurately track employees' time and attendance, resulting in employees working off the clock, not receiving proper compensation for overtime, and a payroll audit would have identified these issues, allowed the company to correct them before legal action was taken. And that yeah. off the clock is a is a problem. It it really is. If if you're not paying attention, you're gonna get uh stung. Yeah, and a lot of times we when we see those stories, Chuck, um, a lot of times when they're like, oh, they didn't have accurate time records, what happens is the company has classified them as exempt. Mm -hmm. And they're like, oh, they're exempt. They're not the punch in, punch out, blah, 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 uh, when they should have been non-exempt, right? And so that's where tracking employees' time is so critical and understanding what they mean by hours worked, I think, is another part of that, um, getting into that as well.
Yeah, I could tell more stories off the clockwork, but we need to move on. So yeah, some yeah. time and attendance, uh, payroll audit number two, some tips. Verify all your employees are accurately recording their hours. Uh, record review time keeping policies to ensure that uh, you are, uh, well, following all applicable laws and regulations. Here's the other one. Verify uh, breaks and meal periods are being accurately tracked and recorded and review the the records of uh employee absences and and I I actually just got to just share one more story regarding meal breaks and and I it's it, regarding this there's a this you know working healthcare is hard working hospitality is hard uh demand of the job sometimes requires healthcare workers in the industry to work through their meal periods but as many employers including the Detroit Medical Center John uh this week it it came out they eventually learn as federal law says Employees must be paid when their duties demand they work through meal periods and a review of the payroll records at VHS of Michigan Incorporated and their operating as Detroit Medical Center by the U.S. Department of Labor Wage and Hour Division, the shock troops, they showed up, show us your payroll records, and they found out that the facility failed to pay 13 employees for missed meal periods when their meal periods were interrupted or not taken because they were required to go back to work. So it is a prevalent thing. There's so much more to that story, but I need to move yeah. on to number three. Yeah, no, that's a great story. And, and again, it's a simple, simple thing. And you think, I think a lot of times what happens is we get into that rhythm, right? We're in payroll, we get in the rhythm, we get the information. But one of the things as a payroll professional, if there is garbage coming into your office, meaning that the employees and the managers are not properly clocking in and clocking out, it doesn't matter what you do, you're still not going to get the right pay thing out there. And so it's going back and auditing not only what you're doing, but what the managers and super employees are doing when they're punching in and punching out is really critical in there as well. All right. So number three, Chuck, what is number three, the area? That we number need to three focus on? is paychecks, paychecks, paychecks. Paychecks, 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 John. Verify all your employees are being paid correctly. Wages, overtime benefits, failing to play employees for all hours, miscalculating overtime pay, failing to deduct the correct amount for taxes. Here's the deal. If you do payroll, when you run payroll, especially through any of these companies, before you submit payroll, there's something called the payroll register. Okay, it's an Excel spreadsheet. You downloaded it. You look through it. You look to make sure. I, I know, folks, if you have hundreds of employees, it's tough, right? It's tough, but you have to look through before you hit the big blue button or the big green button that says transmit <laughs> payroll. You got to look through that payroll register. I've looked through payroll registers. I found where, because I, I call it, uh, it may not be a great term, fat fingering or just misfingering. Instead of paying someone, uh, uh, maybe they were getting maybe 2500 for the week as salary employees, they get 25000 because someone miskeyed an extra zero, put the decimal point wrong, or someone got paid 25 cents instead of, you know, $25 an hour. I mean, just crazy things like that. So you've got to look through that. You know, in 2020, large retailer, perhaps maybe Walmart or something like that, was sued for failing to properly calculate overtime for its employees. The lawsuit said the company failed to include certain bonuses and incentives in the overtime calculations. We talk about this so much during our payroll classes. It's called the regular rate of pay. We don't have enough time to go into it, but you have to make sure that you do a thorough audit of your payroll to make sure that those things are caught. Yeah. And I, and I think that's good. I know we need to take a break, Chuck. Um, but one of the things I will say is regular rate is not their hourly rate. Regular rate is their hourly rate plus those bonuses, incentives, all that kind of stuff. In fact, on our, I think it was our Facebook group, somebody was asking like, hey, I have this situation. I want to make sure I'm properly paying these people. How do I do that? How does that calculate in there? And everyone jumped in, of course, I explained it to them. Um, so make sure that if you're 
paying somebody overtime, it's their regular rate, which is not only their standard rate, right? But it's also the um, any bonuses or anything that was included in that. Not discretionary bonus, but pretty much any other type of bonuses in there. All right, Chuck, let's take a quick story. You are listening to the HR Stories podcast, where there is a lesson in every story. Harassment at work continues to be a major issue. But do you know what to do when one of your employees tells you they have been harassed at work? The team at HR Stories is presenting a half-day workshop called Investigating Harassment Complaints. Registration information is in the show notes, or you can go to hrchecklist.com and register for our newsletter. Welcome back from the break, ladies and gentlemen. This is John and Chuck. We are talking about payroll audits today and the five major payroll audits that you need to do. Chuck, what you got? Yeah, John, you mentioned our Facebook page. Folks, if you're new to the HR Stories podcast and you're just meeting us, the team at HR Stories, we have a Facebook page. We've got almost 2,700 people. It is dynamic. It is active. We're adding 30 to 40 people a week to this. HR professionals, business owners, anyone that has HR responsibilities. It is free. It is a service that we offer to you. It is called the Team of One HR Community. It is on Facebook. We would love for you to check it out, search it out, and join. And it is free. John, I have... I, and I know I got to pick up the pace here. I'm just so excited about some of these things. But number four, the fourth area to focus on in your payroll audit, it goes without saying, but it's compliance. The big C word, compliance, right? Review payroll processes, procedures, ensure compliance to laws, regulations. Look, common mistakes include failing to file necessary tax forms, miscalculating payroll taxes, not doing the minimum wage, not uh, adhering to overtime regulations. You know, in 2021, transportation company fined $1.5 million, failed to properly calculate payroll taxes. Company had incorrectly classified certain employees as independent contractors. And you see, these are all tied together, by the way, uh, and failed to withhold the appropriate taxes. A payroll audit would have identified these things. So what would be some tips so to make sure in this case I'm being compliant? Yeah. So first thing is know your laws know your state laws, know what taxes you need to be taking out. And this is where the efficiency comes in. You've got to find a payroll processing service. They, they can be inexpensive. They can be expensive. But a lot of times these services will take care of these things. And a lot, of, John, it, it also, they will, a lot of states, every state requires you reporting new hires to yep. the state. And so- so these services will take care of that. I'm not trying to advocate any particular service, but that's part of the efficiency. So you want a couple of tips. Review the payroll process and ensure compliance with the laws. Verify all, all necessary tax forms are filled out. Do you have a W-4 on every one of your employees? I do. Uh-huh. Yeah. Well, I guess do. what? Yeah. Uh, is it an option? No, no, it's not an option. You've got to have a W-4. You got to review the payroll taxes, verify minimum wages. And if you have garnishments, you're taking garnishments out, make no. sure you're doing that properly. Make sure you are following those court orders. Just so many compliance things that can trip you up. And finally, we're almost to the end here. The fifth and final area is record keeping. The, the the three D's of record keeping, document, 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 verify all necessary payroll records are being maintained and retained for the proper amount of time. Common mistakes include failing to retain necessary records, failing to keep records in a secure and confidential manner, failing to keep accurate, up-to-date payroll records. And here's another one, actually keeping records, payroll records too long. Because, folks, everything's discoverable, and I wouldn't keep things longer than what the government says to to keep them. You know, in 2017, a Florida base, there it is, Florida in the news again. They call it Florida Man. <laughs> uh, yeah, Florida Man was, was, uh, was, was fined $1.2 million for failing to 
maintain accurate records. The company failed to keep accurate payroll records of employee hours worked, resulting in employees being underpaid, and a payroll audit could have uh, un uncovered these and prevented the legal action. So when you are doing a record keeping audit, the first thing is verify that where you are keeping your payroll records, they're maintained and retained for the appropriate amount of time. Wow, uh, that's a lot, right? And so what are those records that we need to look at, right? So we have employee earning records. We have yes. payroll tax records. Yes. We have W-4s, time cards, time sheets, records of engarnishments and wage assignments. Yeah. So there's a lot, right? And so then you have to know what the length of time is for each one of those, right, Chuck? And so you have to be like, all right, how long do I need to keep them? And I think there's this tension between I want to get rid of it as soon as I need to get rid of it. And I also don't have time to do that because I'm too busy doing other things. Um, and so I think people knowing those dates. And one of the things that I found really helpful for me is when I create that record, I always put on, this is when I need to get rid of it. Right. So I put that date right on the top. So I can, when I go through my files, oh, that's passed. Right. And so maybe once a year, maybe twice a year, I go through all my records and go just pull out the stuff that are, has expired at that time. Yeah. Yeah. You create a tickler file. And a lot of people are like, oh, they're electronic. A lot of times, John, I'll print backups because if you change payroll systems midstream and, and you are not able to keep some of those records or you, you fail to, a lot of times if you have the paper backups, but just real briefly, uh, earning records, three years. Employers required to keep these records for three years under the Fair Labor Standards Act. Payroll tax records, the IRS says four years. W-4 forms, at least four years after the employee's date of hire. And time cards and time sheets, at least three years, according to the FLSA. And don't forget garnishments. A lot of times people forget these things. They should be kept at least one year after termination of employment, according to the Consumer Credit Protection Act, which basically means if you get a garnishment, someone, you fulfill it, you stop it. I still keep, and you should still keep that record of garnishment in what I call the the private file of an employee, right? There's two different types of files, which we right. don't have time to discuss that here. We do have that in the ultimate book of HR checklists. Just a quick little plug. <laughs> and, you know, and, and then of course, as you say, some States have their own laws for record keeping requirements. So it's always a good idea to check with your state. So anyways, review payroll records, couple of tips including employee files, timesheets, and pay stubs. Verify all records are being kept in a secure and confidential manner. Verify all your records are up to date. Yeah, so here's here's my final thoughts on this episode today, Chuck. I think I need to hire a payroll company. <laughs> <laughs> Right. Because I mean, I, and I don't mean that there, but I, I just, I think in terms of my skill set, um, my skill set is not that detail oriented and doing all that kind of stuff. And so hiring somebody, whether we're hiring a person or hiring a company to make sure that they have these processes lined up is rather important to make sure that we're doing this the right way. Right. But Here's the thing, and I think this is, I, I don't think Chuck mentioned this in the beginning. Just because you have a third party doing it doesn't mean you don't need to do the audits, right? It becomes really important that you know what they're doing because if they get it wrong, the liability is still going to shift. Some of it's going to shift back to you. Um, and so making sure that we do that. So, what are your final thoughts, Chuck? Yeah, well, I just wanted to share that, that sometimes, uh, Companies can get more than one or two of these wrong. And and in fact, this week here, uh, the middle of April 2023, U.S. Department of Labor, Wage and Hour Division again, they found three liquor stores in Mississippi and Tennessee, which, by the way, John, 
some companies, you know, they own several car washes, several retail right. establishments, yep. right? If you have common ownership like this group did, um, then you have to keep that in mind. This, this liquor store group paid employees straight time hours for all hours work. By doing so, they failed to pay the employees time and a half uh, for hours over 40 in violation of the Fair Labor Standards Act. However, that's one aspect. The other one was they did not maintain complete and accurate payroll records. They had to pay $38,837 in back wages and another 38000 in damages. A lot of times people, and what ended up, what ended up happening here was, oh, I work at this store and hey, I need you to go work down the street. So if I worked already 40 hours it. here and we need help down the street at our other location, they would start them over again at, at, as if instead of hour 41 for them and 42 in an eight hour shift, they would just pay them eight hours of straight time, not eight hours of overtime. So, yeah, and that happens a lot. Mm -hmm. When you have one federal, when you have companies all reporting up to one federal employment tax identification number, um, those are considered employees of that one federal. And so you have to pay attention to that. They would get overtime, even though they shifted between companies in there. So, yeah, so good folks, point, Chuck. Write this down as in summary. Uh, the five payroll audit areas are where employee classifications, time and attendance, paychecks, compliance, and record keeping. By completing these audits, you can identify areas that may need improvement and once again, stay ahead of things rather than having the uh, Department of Labor come in and tell you you need to do a payroll audit. You need to do it ahead of time. Folks, we can help you with these things. The team at HR Stories, we offer consulting services. We offer resources. We've got our book, The Ultimate Book of HR Checklist, that is for sale and available to you. Links are all in the show notes. We also offer what I say, consulting, consultation. You can engage with us. You can hire us. We can do payroll audits for you. We can do HR audits. We can be advisors. There is a lot of things that we do that we have seen as HR and management professionals in our career. So that's it. That's my final thoughts, John. All right. Well, thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for listening today. This has been the HR Stories podcast, where there is always a lesson in every story. Chuck, thank you so much. That was wonderful. I hope everyone got something out of it. I am going to take that back and make sure that we are doing our payroll audits here at the team at HR Stories. Um, we will see you next week. Thank you for listening to the HR Stories podcast. The material presented in this podcast is for informational purposes only. Chuck and John always recommend using an employment lawyer or HR consultant to handle any legal concerns or HR issues. We do our best to double check sources and make sure the information we are providing is accurate. We may eliminate or embellish without changing the basic narrative to make the story easier to understand. In certain circumstances, we may change identifying information to protect the innocent. The HR Stories broadcast is brought to you by the team at HR Stories. The team at HR Stories is designed to help anyone with HR responsibilities be better at managing the employee experience. To engage with us, go to the hrstoriesteam.com and learn more about how the team at HR Stories can support your business or nonprofit. Thank you for listening to the HR Stories podcast, where there is a lesson in every story. <laughs>